Good morning. Very glad to have you all with us. Glad we can worship together. Very grateful for all the week, the week we've been through. Some exciting things have happened. Uh, we're also continuing our look at really the story of God's faithfulness to his people and how there's so much in our heritage as Christians that happened even before Christ came. Um, one God at work throughout the ages and uh, it gives us confidence in who we are and what he has done and knowing that he is still there for us. A uh, few announcements before we get started. Um, vacation, uh, sorry, kids club going on downstairs with the uh, continued look at the parables, but grateful for Julie and her gang as they work with some of our younger kids. And this past week, uh, we had a wonderful, lively time uh, uh, with Vacation Bible School. Good number of kids. Uh, so grateful for all of the volunteers that helped make it happen. And, and I got to say, Sarah, as our youth and family ministry worker, did a great, great job um, leading that ministry, which is what she's supposed to do, and she did it well. And uh, the kids really had a great experience. But lots, lots of you helped to make it happen, and thank you, because mission accomplished. Really, it did go well. Now, coming ahead toward that, you've got an announcement in your bulletin um, about coming up, um, that on September 12th, we're, we, uh, one of the families that was there will be having a child baptized, and so we want to, uh, uh, we, we want to have them feel very welcome, and so we're going to have a little bit of a VBS reunion that day. So, uh, so if you have anyone in your families connected that came for VBS, have them come on September 12th. It'll also be the kickoff of our Sunday school, so it's a great combination. Um, on the back side of that sheet is some lists of the different activities still going on this summer with youth and family ministries. All right, so again, excellent. Now, coming up tonight is our relevant service. Some of our families are, are already planning on being there tonight. Sarah's got a good word. I've, uh, if, I did have a chance to look it over, you know. And uh, she's got a good word for us, and we're also very grateful uh, for the folks from New Hope Church that are coming and uh, leading singing as well. There'll be a great worship time. Be there. If you can't be there in person, you can do what Carol and I will do, and we'll tune it in. Uh, we're driving uh, west for our vacation tonight, so we'll tune in and, uh, and watch it uh, as the miles go stre streaming by. So we look forward to seeing that. Um, we also had, before we go on to the, that next slide, is Family Fun Day happened yesterday, and about 100 or so different folk were there at the uh, Town Hall Green, and they, uh, there was games for the kids. Uh, we had the nine square going. There was a dunk tank, which I was able to steer clear of this time. <laughs> and uh, lots of other activities, a lot of fun time. And uh, Eric Briscoe, who's been here before, he's a Hanson resident and has a ministry as a sort of street evangelist using what I would call a chalk talk, but other drawings and such. He's a great uh, presenter of the gospel. He did a good job with that. So a lot of fun, a lot of good things happened, some good conversations. Uh, I even met a family from, from Kenya. I thought, wow, I know that. So that was great. Now to that slide. All-American Assisted Living Center. A week from Wednesday, we'll get, be able to start up again our, um, our services there for the residents. And we'll do it outside. It's much easier for them and for us. And August, September, that should be no problem. We'll see as things go on uh, what, what happens. So that's coming up. And if you'd like to come be part of that and be there to greet and welcome and just uh, make new friends with the residents there, that, that'd be great. So that'd be great if you could take part of that. I think we've got the dinner and a movie next. I want to just uh, not only uh, say that you know, this is a good time to, uh, to welcome people back, folks who can be com comfortable and confident, uh, having that meal, but also the, the movie, this I still believe is just an excellent, is it Jeremy Camp, is that who I'm thinking of? Yeah, the, uh, this movie is beautifully done. I, I'm trying to think if we streamed it or what when it first came out. It, it kind of was scheduled to come out something like March 16th of 2020. The timing wasn't tremendous on that as far as they're getting it, but it's had a good life in rentals and, and online. But it's a very well done movie about this musician, outstanding Christian musician, has been for a number of years. But early on, his young bride dies of cancer. And there's this whole struggle of 
of praying for healing, of is this going to be a challenge to his faith, or is somehow God going to use this for good? You might guess where that's going to end up, but how it ends up is really worth seeing. So that's really worth uh, your time uh, to be there for uh, we, our usual pattern is second Saturday, and so this one will be that on the 11th of September uh, in about a little less than two months, maybe eight weeks. So that's good to look forward to. Tech team can always use uh, new assistants. It's a good skill to have, <laughs> and, uh, and Frank will teach you, and he'll do a good job with that. Now we've got a video to show you about uh, Soul Fest. That was something else that happened just before last Sunday. And this is a little bit of, I believe it's the closing communion, maybe? Closing, closing worship service that happened there um, up in New Hampshire. Filmed by our people. <laughs> and, but that was a great event, but there's another exciting event coming up very soon. Sarah's got some words on that. So coming up in just a few short weeks, we have Connect Fest. It is a one-day Christian concert event right down in Falmouth, actually, at the Cape Cod uh, Fairgrounds. So we have some tickets. It is a free event. We, they do ask that we reserve tickets ahead of time, so we have reserved fr some from the church. Um, so if you'd like to go, let us know. We have about 10 right now that are left that are not claimed, and we can always order more. So let us know. We'd be happy to have you guys join us. It's a great event. Um, we have... I think 15 people already signed up going, so it's going to be awesome. So let me know afterwards. You can see myself or my mom, and we'd be happy to get you guys signed up. Um, it is September 28th. August. I don't, August 28th. Don't listen to me. <laughs> August. Thank you. I'm a little tired. <laughs> uh, I, I got tired this week just watching you get tired, Sarah. So, so that's great. All right. Well, that's excellent. We uh, enjoy so many blessings as the people of God. And let's stand and bless God for his blessings to us as we join in our call to worship. I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where will my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. He who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time on and forevermore. Let's remain standing and join us. Our worship team leads us in still. The Smith family has had two weeks, especially two weeks, that have been just so hectic with Vacation Bible School and I uh, had things with work that were just piled and, um, of course, getting our family off to Florida. And I was thinking, boy, I really need to calm my mind. And then we're singing this song called Still, and Still comes from Psalm 46, verse 10. God says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. So and I, what I got from that was be still is not, just calming my mind is not enough. I have to be still and know that he is God.
oceans rise and thunders roar. I will soar with you above the storm. Father, you are king over the flood. I will be still and know you are God. Find rest, my soul, in Christ alone. Know His power in quietness and trust when the oceans rise and fall. We had a, uh, realized that I've been kind of publicizing the wrong email address for prayers. It is prayer at fcchanson.org. And our apologies to anybody who uh, sent them in and said, why didn't they pray for me? Sorry. Prayer at. And we're grateful everybody has been uh, doing that. And we've gotten quite a number of, of prayers to include in. And uh, so with that, um, just an annou announcement. Some of you may have heard. Haiti had another earthquake, and uh, you know, we have this mission that we support there, the, the orphanage Be Like Brit, for the young woman who died in the, the, the largest of recent earthquakes. And uh, we have, a, we have a, a girl we sponsor at that orphanage. She and the whole orphanage are fine. The, uh, it was built right, and you know, of course that's part of the reason why there's a struggle there, is when you pray for Haiti and you pray for this, you've got to pray for a, uh, you've got to pray for a, a system change. Um, that there can be equity in the government so that the people can be safe. It's the first goal of government is to protect its citizenship. So that's, that's a prayer. We're grateful that they're safe. We, we were looking to pray for change as well and for relief to the many who were hurt and, uh, and the bereaved. Um, so uh, let's join together as we pray. God, thank you that when we know you are God, we can stay still. We can stay confident. We can know our Heavenly Father's got this, and we're safe. And so we thank you for your mercies. Lord, thank you that you teach us how to walk with you. Lord, we thank you for the answered prayers regarding Vacation Bible School, regarding Family Fun Day, regarding Soul Fest. We pray your continued um, bringing that fruit into fullness that uh, those who have been struggling when the thunders roar might know that they can rest safe in you. Lord, we lift to you those who need your healing touch. Thankful for Mary Jane Lozier's progress and we ask you to continue her, stay, her recovery. We pray for our dear Jean Lowther who is back at Wingate, but confused. And so, Lord, please bring your mercy. Thank you, Lord, that for David, who went to, to doctors with what was thought to be an infection in the arm, it was actually a heart attack, that he'd had surgery and is now recovering. But thank you that uh, there was such good skill. Thank you for Nancy Myers having a successful eye surgery. Please continue her recovery. We pray for Ron Carlson, who's had a fall and has a 
blame breed, brain bleed, we ask that you would uh, like that healing to progress quickly and uh, just give him recovery. For a friend of one of us named Linda who has, a, who has breast cancer, Lord, would you uh, give her assurance through this journey and bring her safely through? We've been praying for Roz, Lord, who's had some severe pain and exploratory surgery, showed colitis. As she returns home for care, would you not only help her, but also those providing care for her, that they would have the energy, the endurance, the strength, and the encouragement to help this be successful? Lord, we ask your comfort on the family of those who are grieving, especially Terry Conrad, uh, friends and family, and also for friends and family of Gerald Packard, who was killed in a motorcycle accident. There is family connections to McPhersons, to Bianchis, and others. Lord, please speak peace to troubled hearts. Please provide for those left behind. Help us to show ourselves as belonging to the, the compassionate, loving God who can bring us safely through. When we do ask, Lord, for the nation of Haiti and all those affected by this earthquake, Lord, already a tumult after, um, after a governmental collapse, and we just pray for that troubled journey to make a turn so that governments might indeed protect their people and not just feather their own nests. We pray, Lord, for those right now struggling, having lost home and family and others, and those rushing in to help. We pray, Lord, for change, for mercy now and change to protect for the future. And Lord, each of us has challenges in our lives where we need you. Might be work-related, might be financial, might be relationships. Help us, Lord, walk with us. Help us to not grow weary in well-doing. Help us to know that if we take that moment to be still and know that you are God, you will show us what is right to do. And you'll bring us through the hard parts and bring us to that place where we, we are with you forever. So we thank you. And we remind ourselves that we belong to you as we pray together as Christ has taught us, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you to everyone who supports the ministry of this church, but more than thank you, it's isn't it good to respond to God's generosity with our own saying thank you and trusting him? He gives us so much, he asks a portion, and we can respond with trust and knowing that he will take care of us. But uh, there's baskets in the back here. Folks can donate online through the Donate tab at our website of fcchanson.org. They can be mailed to the church at 639 Main Street. High Street, excuse me. Main Street was a long time ago. Never. Let's dedicate those gifts to God. Oh, Lord, you show your goodness to us in providing. And, Lord, where, where there are those who are in need, help us as the body of Christ to step in and bridge the gap to meeting those needs. But we thank you that you provide for your people and you want the generosity you show to be evident among us as a sign that you are more powerful than the God of money. You are the one we can rely on. So help us to be wise, but help us to have hearts like those of our Savior Jesus. 
Help us to give in a way that demonstrates your grace. And would you use these gifts, Lord, to honor the name of Christ in whom we pray. Amen. reading today is from Acts 7 verses 2 through 8. And Stephen replied, brothers and fathers, listen to me. The God of glory appeared to our ancestor Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he lived in Haran and said to him, leave your country and your relatives and go to the land that I will show you. Then he left the country of the Chaldeans and settled in Haran. After his father died, God had him move from there to this country in which you are now living. He did not give him any of it as a heritage, not even a foot's length, but promised to give it to him as his possession and to his descendants after him, even though he had no child. And God spoke in these terms, that his descendants would be resident aliens in a country belonging to others, who would enslave them and mistreat them during 400 years. But I will judge the nation that they serve, said God, and after that they shall come out and worship me in this place. Then he gave him the covenant of circumcision, and so Abraham became the father of Isaac and circumcised him on the eighth day. And Isaac became the father of Jacob, and Jacob of the twelve patriarchs. Thank you, Shirley. If you've ever walked on a boardwalk, there's several different ones around here. You know, there's a, what's good about them is that if you don't walk on the boardwalk, you're going to be in trouble. I mean, sometimes there could be swamps or bogs or whatever else. And, you know, God had a path for Israel in that other slide, the theme slide of today. Um, the privileges of belonging to God's people. And God was keen on developing them and leading them. I learned something about this in 1995 when I went to Ukraine as part of an educational mission. Back in those days, uh, soon after the fall of the Iron Cur Curtain, the average citizen was rejoicing in their independence from the Russia-based Soviet Union. But average citizens weren't running the country. They had a saying at that time that the only people who knew anything about getting stuff done were either former Communist Party members or Mafia. Hence, the problems. The whole trip was filled with tension. It was nip and tuck whether we would be allowed into the country at all. Customs officials sat in their booths, which had floors elevated two feet above the rest of us, so they could just sit down or look down at us from their seats and scowl. And while we were there, members of our group that were simply being tourists were stopped on the street and required to show their passports and their visas and 
proves that they had declared upon entry into the country to those scowling custom officials anything of value they might possibly have on their person at that time. And then, when it was time to go home, some of our group was detained at customs, and every bag they had was emptied and searched. So it amounted to, we don't want you here, why are you still here, and leaving so soon? <laughs> but coming home, arriving, was a different story. We came in through O'Hare Airport in Chicago. And I don't know if they had pity on us because they knew where we were coming from, but all we heard from U.S. Customs after a quick peek at our passports was, welcome home. And until that moment, I had never understood why people kissed the ground. I got it. They were privileged to being part of this country that I finally appreciated. And it was good to be able to say that I was American. Now, the, the New Testament lesson that Shirley read for us is an outline or part of an outline of the Old Testament story. It was given by Stephen, the first Christian martyr, and he reminded his listeners that God had first disclosed his plan to create a nation for himself and then proceeded to make that plan a reality. Now in this sermon series, I am surveying the story of the Old Testament so we can all better appreciate the wonder, the greatness, the consistency of God's love toward his people. Because of that consistent, excellent love, we can be still and know that God is Lord. And how this love was culminated it all built up toward and was culminated by his sending Jesus into the world. So the Bible tells the story of one God and his love for all people. And that as believers in his son, we are then included in that people. And that's a wonder that we should never fail to appreciate. So today, today I want to help you see and appreciate that God's faithful love for the nation of Israel demonstrates both his grace and his power. And all the more appreciate that. And it demonstrates it all the more when he invites us to join his family. Now, every bit of that sentence is important. Do you have a grasp of God's faithful love for his people, for Israel? As it said in Acts, this goes back to the days of Abraham. God's words to Abraham amounted to asking him to take a tightrope walk. Leave your country, leave your people, leave your father's house, and go to a land that I will show you. You know, no little video travelogue ahead of time. I'll show you when you get there. Need to know. Tightrope walk without a safety net. Why did Abraham agree? To leave everything he'd known. Genesis says it. Romans repeats it. Abraham believed God. He was still and knew God is Lord. There will always be choices we need to make. That are a choice between conventional wisdom. And a choice we know to be right in our souls. But nonetheless risks total failure. Is there somebody that the world says you shouldn't give a second chance to? But maybe God is saying you should. Well, going to an unknown land with unknown support is certainly one of those choices. But read the Old Testament and you will find that God was always true to his promises. He betrothed himself to Abraham and his descendants. He was always true to that vow. The narrative of the Old Testament is testament to the faithful love of our God. And that love followed down the lines of Abraham's family tree. Now, God had promised Abraham that he would build a great nation out of Abraham's descendants. And he's saying this to a man without children. So what happens is the first generation. There's one son born of disobedience and one out of, out of obedience, and by a miracle, by the way. One son, not making progress toward that great nation thing yet. 
Next generation, twin sons, and God says the promise will come only through one. Now, so here we are, two generations, and the population hasn't really increased. Now, you know, Carol works for the Alden House. John and Priscilla Alden, Mayflower Pilgrims, ten kids. That's the way you populate a future <laughs> nation. But after two generations for Abraham, one had become one. There's no increase, no great nation yet. Was Abraham's trust in God's faithful love well-founded? Question mark. He kept passing down to Abraham's descendants, to the patriarchs, what had been promised to them. They knew the promise. Would it work? And what happened to the next generation? Now the wheels on the train get some purchase. Twelve sons to Jacob. Now we're getting somewhere. We see, begin to see some fruit. It takes the miracle of Joseph sold into slavery to keep Jacob's line from dying out. But we see that God will go to whatever lengths it takes to keep his promises to his people. His love for his people is faithful. He delivered on what he promised to the patriarchs. I don't know if you can find more irony than in what happened in and around Joseph. The executive hero who brings an empire safely through a de devastating famine is a former slave and criminal. But in God's eyes, saving the empire was simply a nice byproduct. It wasn't the big deal. Because Joseph made sure there was food in Egypt, Jacob's son, could survive with their family. That family included Judah, who is only a bit player in the story of Joseph, but it's his line that produced King, J King David and eventually Jesus. So he's, in a very real sense, the most important patriarch of all the tribes of Israel. But the line would never have reached King David if God had not preserved his people. And he preserved them through the whole cauldron of Egyptian enslavement. At first, the family of Jacob, of Joseph and Judah, were welcomed into Egypt as rescuers of the country. But soon, hatred toward outsiders took over. Pharaoh tried to kill the Hebrew boy babies, as if to say that some babies are more valuable than others because of the circumstances surrounding their conception. But if baby Moses hadn't survived, that would have been it for God keeping his promise to his people. Keeping an enslaved nation alive 40 years in the wilderness was humanly impossible. But the whole project was nearly doomed to failure before it got that far. Or freed enslaved people. But the attack on the Hebrew boys some 80 years prior, was only the beginning. Conditions for the enslaved Hebrews became more and more difficult. The people groaned under the whips of their slave masters. And then God implemented the next step in his plan. He makes a plan, he discloses it, and he keeps on being true to it. Moses had fled Egypt to hide away as a shepherd in the wilderness, God convinced Moses to become his instrument in delivering his people from the brutal tyranny of their slavery. Egypt had all the power, humanly speaking. But God will do whatever it takes to keep his promises for his people. God increased the pressure on the tyrant who was imprisoning God's people until Pharaoh could do it no longer. Pharaoh could take it no longer. And by means of the miracle of Passover, Moses led God's people out of the Red Sea. And with an army behind them and floodwaters in front of them, God told Moses, ask me for a miracle. Moses did, God delivered. God will do whatever it takes to keep his promises for his people. I think I've said that a couple times now. He didn't just lead them out to just to have them keep on walking forever. God's purpose was for Israel to see that their leaders trust 
in God's promises was vindicated in the settlement of the promised land. You know, as we heard, they were carrying around the bones of Abraham, Joseph too, because they believed God was going to keep his promise and give them a land of their own to bury those honored bones. Now, that's not to say there uh, wasn't some walking left to do. Uh, this is going to be Exodus 13, 17 to 22. Let's see. Make sure I got this right. Go ahead. When Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them by way of the land of the Philistines, although that was nearer. For God thought, if the people face war, they may change their minds and return to Egypt. So God led the people by the roundabout way of the wilderness toward the Red Sea. The Israelites went up out of the land of Egypt, prepared for battle. And Moses took with him the bones of Joseph, who had required a solemn oath of the Israelites, saying, God will surely take notice of you, and then you must carry my bones with you from here. They set out from Sukkoth and camped at Etham on the edge of the wilderness. And the Lord went in front of them in a pillar of cloud by day, to lead them along the way, and in a pillar of fire by night, to give them light, so that they might travel by day and by night. Neither the pillar of the cloud by day, nor the pillar of fire by night, left its place in front of the people. God used direct means to let the people know where the path was, to lead them where they should go. You know, the trip could have only taken two and a half years, but their disobedience meant more time in the wilderness was required so they could learn obedience. You know, we, you know one of my favorite quotes about, uh, remember that TV show 24, you know, Jack Bauer and all that? And if somebody said if people had just done what Jack Bauer said, the show would have been called 12. <laughs> Israel has a show called 40 and if they'd obeyed, it would have been called two and a half. <clears throat> Sometimes in our lives, when we are frustrated that things aren't going the way we think they should, our obedience to God should be examined. Still, the faithful love of God was at work. The nation of Israel was established in the land we know as Israel today. The great nation part of the promise was nearly complete. But another part of the promise was, all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. What was up with that? Okay, so we're tracking the story of how God's faithful love for Israel demonstrates both God's grace and his power. I want us to consider God's grace on behalf of Israel. What is this grace we're talking about? Grace is God's favor to the undeserving. If I have a new car and I hand it over to you because you have a gun to my head, that's not grace, that's duress. <laughs> but if I give it to you freely because I think it would bless your day, that's grace, unmerited kindness. There are many miracles chronicled in the history of God's dealing with the nation of Israel. They are evidence of Israel's special status in heaven's eyes. And I'm going to outline them in a few moments. But as I do, you'll see how God used them to intervene on behalf of Israel in order to make his promise to them, make it become a reality. He will, there's nothing he'll stop at. He will go to great lengths to keep his promises. He didn't do it because they deserved it. He did it because it was grace. Deuteronomy 7, 7 and 8 says, The Lord did not set his affection on you and choose you because you were more numerous than all the other peoples, for you were the fewest of the peoples, but because the Lord loved you. Unmerited. Love has its own reasons. God showed his favor to the undeserving. If you read the stories of the leaders of Israel, you'll find plenty of undeserving people. Many of them behave <laughs> more like knaves than knights. Abraham exposes his wife 
to grave danger just to save his own skin. Isaac plays favorite and teaches his son Jacob, who also lies and cheats, to do the same. And other leaders throughout the history of Israel follow suit. God didn't bless them because they were deserving. But that's not how God leaves those men and women along the way also. He teaches them that blessing is found where obedience takes us. Accordingly, we will find each of those men to be excellent men by the time they die. God's grace is not ineffective. God not only showed grace toward Israel, he also showed power. Power in action throughout their history. Four quick examples. Sea, manna, land, and bones. We're going to go right through them quick. Because the sea, with their backs to the water, God makes a way where there seemed to be no way. And if you've got floodwaters threatening you, metaphorical floodwaters, God can part the water. He will protect you. He did it for them. Be still and know he is God. After see manna. You know, how do you serve a, prog a progressive dinner for two million of your closest friends and family? You make the land provide for them. He gave them each their daily bread because they were his special possession. God will stop at nothing to keep his promises. After sea and manna comes the land. The promised homeland for the Jews took hundreds of years to first become reality. But God kept on keeping that promise. Kept on keeping that promise. He defended his people from invaders until Israel's own corruption meant that they needed to be reminded that their greatest treasure was God's favor, not gold or silver. And so they had exile. Exile from the land rekindled their love for the Lord. So he moved heaven and earth again to restore them to their home. You know, in more recent times, you know, I'm not alone in seeing the recreation of a homeland for the Jews during this last century as further evidence of God's faithful love for his people. Now, the last evidence, sea, man, and land, bones, that may seem odd to our Western sensibilities. You know, the people brought the bones of the fathers with them. There's a little bit of ew. The fathers, they had learned to trust God's promises, and they compelled their children to not give them a final burial until the promise of God was fulfilled. Now that way, the remains of the fathers, the forebearers, could rest in the promised land. God's faithful love to his people is amazing. But what's even more amazing is his invitation for us to join his family. Some, but not many of us, have Jewish blood in our veins. But God's plan has always been that all nations would be blessed through Abraham and his descendants. You know, the genealogies of Jesus, if you look at them in Luke and Matthew, they already included foreigners who had joined themselves to God's purposes. But with the resurrection, the command went out to invite all peoples everywhere to join God's family. And once Jesus had made himself a sin offering on behalf of the, of the world, Many more Gentiles joined the family of God. There's a long-standing tradition in the Old Testament of describing the nation of Israel as an olive tree. And in the book of Romans, Paul says that we who are of non-Jewish background were grafted on to that tree. Chapter 11, verse 17 says, You, although a wild olive shoot were grafted in among the others and now share in the nourishing root of that olive tree. Now, probably you're like me and you more often hear the word graft and it means corruption. <laughs> that's, not, that's, that's really just slang. Back when everybody did agriculture, because we all live closer to the soil, grafting was a pretty common thing. You take a branch from one tree, that's the little one sticking out there, 
and you bind it to the trunk. Probably the Israelites did not use black electrical tape, but that's okay. But whatever way you do to bind it to the trunk of a strong tree, at the point of an opening in that strong tree's bark, and from that same tree, you can get fruit in two different origins. The next slide will show that. Around the world, more Christians are of non-Jewish origins than not. God has grafted us in. And this graft is a good thing. We were abandoned street urchins, and the king opened the palace doors to us. Membership in the family of God also means you are a citizen of heaven. Not long after I came back from Ukraine, I recruited a woman named Myrna to go to Russia on another portion of the same mission. It was a different country, but it was still former Soviet Union, so a lot of the experience was the same. And Myrna became very close to her translator. And when it came time to come home, Myrna cried so hard. Because she could go home to America and leave all those troubles and struggles behind. But her translator had to stay in Russia's desperate conditions. Citizenship makes all the difference. We were invited to join God's family. It's an awesome privilege. Is your citizenship in heaven? If so, then this world is not your home. I can't feel at home in this world anymore. If you are a citizen of heaven, you reap daily benefits. Have you ever alienated yourself from someone and then you found you needed to ask them for a favor? Hello? Awkward calling. <laughs> but God makes us his children, citizens of his kingdom. And so he welcomes our prayers. He is eager to hear the requests of your heart. Another daily benefit is that God screens what happens to his children. He allows nothing to happen that he cannot use for good. We don't always see how he's using it for good. But we see enough examples that we can trust him for the rest. Read about a woman named Rhea Story. Story is her last name. She was raised on an isolated farm in Alabama. She was sex sexually abused by her father from age 12 to 19. Desperate to escape, she left home at 19 without a job, without a car, or even a high school diploma. But she learned to trust God. Rhea learned to be resilient and not only survive, but thrived. Her story is available on Amazon. And one reviewer, angered by the evil that can be perpetrated by those in authority, and the proper response to the outrageous is outrage, this reviewer described the book as an excellent story of what God can do with any life, even after years of hurt and feeling worth, worthless. Even after feeling worthless, God can do great things. And her testimony now inspires and encourages others. You know, last week we showed how God is always at work to call to himself a people to be his very own. And this week we are examining God's faithful love for the nation of Israel. He loved them enough to teach them to keep his love for them in the front of his mind. And there were two methods he used to teach them to keep that, keep his love in the front of their minds. And we need to learn both those lessons. The first lesson is record keeping. One of the most sacred objects in the history of Judaism was the Ark of the Covenant, which contained the two stone tablets of the Ten Commandments, Aaron's walking stick that, that had miraculously blossomed, and also a pot of manna. God also had the people make monuments to the miracles he had done on their behalf, piling up stones. He wanted them to remember his favor to them, and keeping records of those miracles would help. He also commanded them to tell the stories of what he had done. So storytelling. It's much more likely that you remember the stories that are part of my sermons than any carefully worked out logic, as if there were any. But the power of God's storytelling, you know, the storytelling, 
is the listener becoming personally involved in the story? You know, that's the good story when what's going to happen next? The more you can feel what it was like to depend upon the leading of God when they were out in the wilderness all those years, the more likely you will listen carefully to what God is saying to you. Now, if you've been following along with the sermon notes, in that, the outline that's in the bulletin, uh, you, you'll see the last blank is different. There is no pre- predetermined right answer. It's up to you. This is a picture of a recreation of the actual Ark of the Covenant, what it must have looked like. God had Israel put reminders of his faithfulness in the Ark of the Covenant that they carried. These were absolute treasures because they reminded the people undeniably that God would come through on their behalf. So I've got to ask, what's in your ark? You thought I was going to say wallet, I know. What's in your ark? Do you have a baby picture of your first child? Do you have a letter from your grandmother? Do you have that college diploma that no one thought you could earn? Do you have a rose from the bouquet that was bought when your marriage started over again? If you've never gathered faith treasures in your own personal ark, it's a good time to start. God's faithful love for the nation of Israel demonstrates both his grace and his power And all the more since he invites us to join his family. Praise God for his faithful love. Let's pray. Oh Lord, build a strong bridge in our hearts and our lives and our awareness between the reality of your faithful love for your people throughout the ages and your love active and powerful for each one here, each one within the sound of my voice now, today, and in each day of the future. That we can stand strong when the oceans rise and the thunders roar. That we can accomplish the purposes you have because you love this world so much. That we not be overcome, but rather overcome on your behalf. That your kingdom spread from shore to shore. Honor and praise and glory to you, our God and King. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our closing hymn is 710. It's We Are Called to Be God's People.
Lord, how good it is to know that your faithful love accompanies us, accompanies us as we go forward. Oh, Lord, let your grace abide upon each one. And so assure us and guide us that we joyfully proclaim that you are inviting all to join your family. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.